Hey, welcome to Midday Moments with Pastor Ponder. Midday Moment for a Tuesday. Uh, come to you with a um, little, little nostalgia in my mind this morning. I, I, want, to, I want to share with you where my, where my heart's at today. I, um, I'm going to give you about this much of my life story and tell you where, where my, my mind has been this morning and, and why that is. Then we'll, then we'll get into our, our song. Um, my dad pastored at Liberty Baptist Church in a community of Spring Creek over in Madison County, North Carolina. And we, we lived there for, for four years. The way I can remember that is the grades I was in, five, six, seven, and eight. Mail too, so uh, <laughs> look beyond that. A little oversight on, on my part, um, but yeah, I um, I graduated from the eighth grade uh, with with some folks, and I never realized uh, at the time how formative those four years of my life was. I sat down this morning and and, and wrote a list down. I came up with eleven. There was there was twelve or thirteen, maybe fourteen people in that eighth grade class. And I was able to sit down this morning and compose a list of 11 of those. And I, and I, I forgot somebody, and, and somebody may reach out to me. I'm, I'm friends with a few of you on Facebook. Uh, uh, I only know maiden names except for Janet. Janet texted me, uh, and she's been following our, our, uh, our midday moments. And she requested another song for today, and I'm going to sing another song for Janet. But I sat down and wrote down these names. Now, I'm sure that the guys' names are still the same, but, but I don't know the married names of everybody. But I wrote down Patty Coward, Janet Worley, Daryl Willett, Maxine Burns, Doug Snelson, Michael Holt, Donna Rogers, Lynn Price, Billy Green, Teresa Ferguson, and Blaine Kennedy. And those names just came to my mind, bam, 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 bam. And I sat down and I did the math. That was in 79, 89, 99, 09, 41 years ago. I had no idea how formative those years were. I've got memories that, that are near and dear to my heart from, from those days and, and the fact that I could remember those, those 11 names and their faces and stories about them. And that just, it just blows my mind. And uh, I, I just I think about those days often. And uh, if any of you out there, uh, I, I think I'm friends with a few snail. I think maybe Robin, Doug's sister Robin may be friends with, but i love to hear from you. Maybe we can put us together some kind of a, of a of an event sometime, some kind of a of a reunion or something of that class. Uh, I don't know where everybody wound up. I think most of them went to Madison High, uh, but Dad moved us to North Carolina um, uh, over and around to Weaverville up for North, I went to North Buncombe High School. Anyway, that means nothing to nobody except those 11 or 12 or 13 kids that graduated from Spring Creek from the eighth grade way back in 1979. Janet, Thank you for asking for this song. I hope it blesses your heart. It's a great, great song. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a often forfeit Oh, what needless pain we bear Oh, because we do not carry everything to God in discouraged 
take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrow share? Jesus knows our every I was getting ready to, for this midday moment. I was looking through some of my notes and found this verse to the song. I don't know if somebody wrote it or if I found it in an old hymn book somewhere, but I wrote it down in some of my notes. Uh, listen to this verse. This is one we don't sing in church too often, but it's a great, great verse. Listen to this one. Blessed Savior, Thou hast promised Thou burdens bear. May we ever, Lord, be bringing all to Thee in earnest prayer. Soon in glory bright unclouded No need for prayer. Rapture praise and endless worship will be our sweet portion Father, I love you and I praise you for this new day, for the opportunity, Lord, just to stop by and, and offer a word of encouragement, maybe a word of instruction or a word of hope uh, to folks that might need it today. I ask a blessing, Lord, on those that are bearing up under great burdens of life, meaning, Father, they're facing circumstances and situations that to them seem overwhelming, about to overpower them and swamp their boat. But I pray, God, you'd comfort them. I ask you, Lord, you'd provide just exactly what they stand in need of, be it financial, be it physical, maybe a relationship that needs a touch. Whatever it is, Lord, I pray, whatever the need is, I pray, God, you'd prove yourself to be all that they need you to be and more. Bless these moments together in your word. Use me for your glory. Forgive my sin. Cleanse me, Lord, of sin in my heart and my mind that would hinder me, Lord, from being used by you this day. And I'll gladly praise you for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Miss Tammy, go get my watch, and I can turn that off. That rings again. I can stop it with my, with my smart watch. You wouldn't care. I want you to bring your Bibles to James chapter number 4. Uh, James chapter 4, and again, as I said yesterday in our introduction, really just to make the devil mad, uh, all this week, I'm going to be exposing and expounding on things that Satan won't ever tell you. Now, in the introduction yesterday, we looked at John chapter 8, verse number 44, where Jesus himself said that Satan is the father of lies. He, he said from the very foundation, he's been the father of lies. But here's, here's what I challenge you with today. Could we not all agree that you can actually deceive somebody without actually telling them a lie. I think we could all agree to that point. So yesterday we looked at the idea that Satan may not want you to know it, but he is the great deceiver and has been since the very beginning of time. But the truth of the matter is the most devious type of deception is to work hard to keep somebody from knowing the truth. Think about that. That's exactly how Satan works. And I'm convinced that there are some things that the devil would rather you not know. I think there's some things that he, he may not necessarily lie boldface to you, but some things that he would just assume that you, as, uh, as a born-again child of God, that you just uh, rather you didn't know. But at the same time, I think this truth applies to those of you that don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. 
So these truths are important to us today. You still need to know these truths. The devil may not want you to know them, but you still need to know them. And I have an obligation to tell you these things. Now, instead of addressing any specific lies that Satan may speak into your life, as I said yesterday, there's far too many than we could ever touch in our few minutes together. My intent is to use God's word to reinforce four or five very important spiritual truths that you need to hang on to in your walk with the Lord. Truths that Satan doesn't want you to know. By now, hopefully you found James chapter 4. And in his little short epistle, James is going to give us our, our second spiritual truth. One was the devil is a liar and the father of lies, the great deceiver. We saw that yesterday. Number two uh, for today, I need you to be aware of the fact that life is brief and we all need to prepare today. Now, I want you to listen to James chapter 4, verse number 13. And I'll say this. If you listen to last week's series Dr. Seuss and the Gospel, this verse may ring a little bit familiar in your mind because we use this same verse when we talked about the book, Oh, the Places You'll Go. But listen to James 4.13 a second time because it sure won't hurt you. <laughs> James 4.13, Go to now ye that say, Today or tomorrow we'll go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little while and then vanisheth away. Verse 13, what James is describing for us is a common Middle Eastern business practice. Uh, but he uses it to illustrate a very dangerous attitude. And the attitude is presumption. To presume something to be automatically true. Let me, let me very, very quickly tell you what he's, what he's referencing here. It was common among Jewish men as they grew up they, uh, in, in, in Middle Eastern culture for them to, to save up a large amount of money and then they'd purchase some kind of a product that was available where he lived and he felt that he could sell somewhere in a far off place that did not have that, be it a, 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 a produce item, something he grew, something they produced, some kind of a man handmade something, something that was readily available where he lived. And he would pack a lot of that up, sink all his money into that, buy it up, pack it up, and journey off to, to some far city. And he might spend a year or more selling those goods, make a large profit, and then just before his return home, he'd flip it around. He'd buy something in that particular part of the world and bring it back home and sell that for a profit in his hometown. Kind of like the produce guys do today, running over and buying watermelons or going to buy apples and bringing them over and selling. That, that same kind of logic is still very, very clear and apparent today. Once he came home, the dream would be that he would sell all of those goods, make them enough money to be wealthy and maybe even retire or to keep on buying and selling. At least that was the plan. Unfortunately, a, a more common occurrence sounded like this. The aspiring merchant, would buy up that product, whatever it was, in his part of the world, in his own hometown, and he'd run off to another town, try to sell that, and end up getting stuck with it. And the rest of his life, he would spend in a little shop somewhere trying to sell that little bit of stuff that he had acquired and couldn't do anything with. Now, James is not necessarily condemning the practice here. It's not that at all. Uh, it's, it's the spirit. It's the attitude that James is talking about. It's the spirit in that kind of thinking that James is, is attempting to kind of to, to squelch or to reprove. And, and his message, I think, to us is pretty clear. Each one of us is facing a future that is unknown at best. None of us have any kind of clue what the future holds. And let's think way beyond, I know we beat this coronavirus thing to death and we use it a whole lot, but let's think way beyond that. And just our, our future in general, the future of our children, the future of our own uh, health, our own financial situation. And Satan would have every one of you listening to this little devotion today, Satan would have every one of you believe that you're going to live forever. Uh, there, there is an inherent danger that comes with going through life thinking that uh, you're living for the moment and not thinking towards the future, realizing 
exactly what James tells us, that our life is nothing but a vapor. See, Satan would love nothing more than for you to go through life with that attitude of presumption or presuming. Oftentimes, uh, as we're trying to, to live and walk a life of faith, presumption can kind of sneak up on us. Uh, we, we, God's, God's been good to us, and we, we rest in that confidence. Yes, we do. But sometimes we, we work uh, more at working on under our presumptions than we do living a life of faith. And honestly, it's, James tells us why that is. It's because we, we, um, we're just not honest about who we are. We don't, we don't embrace the fact, as he says there in verse number 14, James says, what is your life? He said, it's just a vapor. It appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Now, I'll, I'll be the first to say, I, I turned 55 back in March, and, and we recognize that. The older we get, you know, life passes by. We, we're, we're, we become the old man in the room and telling the young people, hey, take advantage of these moments. Your kids grow up fast. And I, I've had all these people tell me those lines down through the years, and now I'm the dude using those same lines. But I'm hearing kids today, though. Even our children are talking about how fast time flies. I think it's just all speeding up. I think life itself is just moving out at a breakneck speed. But along the way, we, we arrogantly build up this, this image of, of self-importance that, that we are in control more than we actually are. We convince ourselves that, that I'm the master of my destiny and that I'm driving this boat and we don't look towards the, the end of this life when in reality, our life is, is equal to, to the mist or, or the fog that might roll up off the river in the early, early mornings and it appears for a little while and as soon as the sun comes up, it burns off and it's gone. Here's what Satan would rather you not know. Satan would rather you not know that your life is here today and gone tomorrow. Any plans that we try to make are dependent upon the continuance of our existence at best, which is frail and uncertain. We look towards the future, make all of these big, big plans and sprawling plans, and everything that we conceive in our mind is all hinging upon our still being alive. See, we can't build all of our hopes in this life alone. We can only put our hope in Him because that's the only thing that will last. Now, I'm not telling you not to plan. I've, I've said it before from the pulpit of New Salem. I think, I think you ought to plan like you're going to live forever, but you need to live like you could die today. And I think that's a good piece of logic for all of us. The Bible pages are just filled with those whose life made a, a, an incredible uh, impact during the moment that they were in the spotlight very brief period of time, then they'll never be forgotten. We, we pass through periods of life like that, like those four years I spent on Spring Creek. Four years from fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth. I can't remember how old you are when you graduate eighth grade, 12, 15, I don't know how old you are. But that, those four years of my life, I, I've got, there's a huge piece of, I think of my growing up I did. I don't know, I just, it sticks out in my mind. And these, there's guys in the Bible that, that flash onto the pages of God's, of God's word into, into the spotlight of history and touch people's lives and then fade away just as quickly. I mean, think about the patriarchs of the faith. Think about people like Abraham and Moses. Think about Peter and James and John and the apostle Paul. They all came to understand the value of their life. They knew that their only hope was in the Lord they didn't revel in their own self-importance. They, they put God's will above everything else in their lives. So I have to ask you today, what about you? Are you going through life with that attitude of presumption, trusting in the, in the tangible things of this life, placing value on this life, placing maybe more value than you should on the frailty and the briefness of this life, that which is here today and gone tomorrow? I think standing in stark contrast to the whole idea of living life with an attitude of presumption is the attitude of faith, living life in an attitude of faith. So the question that we have to ask ourselves today is simply this, am I living this life honestly by putting my faith and trust in Jesus Christ? Trusting him enough to say, I'll live every day of my life according to your will. I'll live my life according to your plan for my life, Lord. By your will I shall live.
Satan would have loved nothing more for you to look at the future and just assume that everything is going to be okay. But there's really only one way to you, for you to face the future, my friend. Rest on things that are certain. Trust in Jesus who says to not worry about today, but put every future moment into his hands. Now, on the other side of that conversation, of course, is if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, then presumptuous living in your life means that you're going to face death and spend eternity in hell. And you may be living that life today, presuming that you're somehow six foot tall and bulletproof. But the same logic that applies to us as believers definitely applies to you as, a, as one that's still seeking that life is just a vapor. It appears for a little while and fades away. Satan would love nothing better than for you to keep trusting in yourself and to keep on rejecting Jesus Christ and the calling of the Holy Spirit, putting off until tomorrow decisions that have an eternal ramification. But the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse number 2 that now is the accepted time, that today is the day of salvation. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27 assures us that it's appointed unto man once to die, and after that comes the judgment. We have that to face. And when Christians live with the assumption that I've always got tomorrow to start living and walking closer to Jesus, then we're going to miss out on a spirit-filled, joy-filled life. But when a lost person lives that way, I've got all kinds of time. I've got tomorrow. I'll, I'll give my life to Jesus. I'll start going to church. I'll, I'll, I'll live my life differently. I'll make the changes tomorrow. Uh, I've, I've got too much to do today. I'm too young. I'm, I'm too full of life. But we know this, that James 4.14 applies to all of us, be we saved or lost. We can't afford to live uh, a life with the attitude of presumption guiding our choices and guiding our decisions. Proverbs chapter 27 verse number one tells you this, my friend, listen closely. Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring. We can't risk being like the farmer over in Luke chapter 12 when Jesus tells the story. He says, So thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. I leave you again with James 4.14. You don't know what your life will be like tomorrow. You're just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Don't go through life with that attitude of presumption. The devil don't want you to know it, but life is brief. Today is the day to make those changes and cry out to him while you're on this side of eternity. And he'll save you and give you joy unspeakable and full of glory. Amen. Amen. Hey, now don't forget, tonight, 7 o'clock, Right here at New Salem, where the Mike Waterhouse will be offering a small group Bible study. We'd love you to come be part of that small group. Wednesday night, I'll be in the sanctuary up at the church, uh, continuing our, our study through Habakkuk. That'll be live streaming live on Facebook and our YouTube channel. And then Thursday morning, come be with us for our men's breakfast. I think Brother Roy might be making pancakes. Maybe not. That was him calling a while ago, so we may be changing that. But we'll definitely meet. We will definitely meet uh, Thursday morning for fellowship and, and, and eat something together at 9 o'clock right there in the fellowship hall. And then the news of the week is, of course, Sunday morning, 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. We're back for corporate worship right there in the sanctuary of New Salem Church. Make plans to be with us. And until I can see you again face to face, may the Lord bless you, make his face to shine on you. Join me again on Wednesday for another midday moment as we walk through these things that the devil would rather you not know. God bless you folks. Have a great day.